holding back and waiting isn't going to make that jump any easier. It's going to happen. You're going to do it. You've come all this way to race this race. You're not going to stay on the ferry. week out from the race, I am heading down to the start of the swim to get in the water. I haven't done any cold water acclimatisation really at all yet, um, so I'm glad I've got a week to get used to it. I'm not sure how <laughs> happy I am about seeing this poster. <laughs> this is fine, 50 metres, I mean they can come closer. <laughs> I'm assuming this is the distance they have to come to me before I shit myself. <laughs> person in there. Luckily didn't see any whales. <laughs> uh, yeah, just clear and the water tastes amazing. It's really not very salty. Uh, been in for about half hour. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, like getting in was hard on the face. I can, I, you can probably tell my, oh, my face is numb. <laughs> um, but once you're in and moving, like, I think it's going to be okay. I've got a few tweaks I need to do on the kit, but, um, yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed that. We actually spent all of our race week in Koike until the last minute and then came down to near where the race starters um, just because we preferred to be up in Koike. One of the other advantages with coming out early is that you get a feel for the ground and you need to plan that into your logistics. You know, for the for the nights before the race, you need to stay in Puerto Chacabuco or Puerto Esan, which are the two towns that are near to the start point. But then after you finish, you want to be returning to Koike which is an hour and a half away from the start and you pass it on the bike uh, because that's where the next day everything happens for the awards and it's a more central location, it's a bigger town, it's a nice place to spend some time. I definitely found that being in Koike was an advantage because I could get out and recce most of the course and it's more central, uh, but it's also beautiful and there's amazing trail running around there. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely place to spend some time. It's seven degrees. Um, the forecast for race day is to be a bit colder. So it's gonna be quite nippy in the morning. Um, we're driving the reverse of the first 90 Ks of the bike route just now. And I'm gonna ride some of it back after the swim and just see how that feels. Um, have a look at the course, 
just enjoy the scenery, enjoy being on the bike here. Uh, there's not much time for that on race day. Ah, so another rubble section of road here. I do remember this one from last time. It takes a lot of courage to just sign up for Patagon Man. And then you have to travel a huge long way to the other side of the world. And there's a lot of logistics tied up in that. So I want to not only tell the story of my race, but also try to give as much information as possible to people so that they can plan and then come and have the best race they can have down here as well. On the Friday before the race, there is a practice social swim at one of the bays that's near where the actual swim is. You can't get in the water at the swim location before the race because it's quite a busy port. Okay, get some swimming done. What's your name? My name is Elias. And where do you live? Well, I live in this country, but I was born in Venezuela. Oh, Venezuela. Yes. Is it beautiful here? Do you like it here? Yes, I like it here. Do you like to see all the triathletes come and visit? What? You see all these people from around the world? Yeah. Is it exciting? See. What do you like about it? I don't know. You don't know? Yeah. You practice your English? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm practicing English. Good stuff. Okay, you better go. Bye. See you later. Adios. John Medina is a guy who is a local Chilean said well, we've got a really basic cabin do you think you'll be okay we're not sure it's comfortable <laughs> um, and it's amazing it's in the middle of nowhere comes with a dog <laughs> so the lady who owns the cabin her two daughters were at the practice room so they basically um, they know John through triathlon there he started a local triathlon club here um, a couple of years ago and these young girls um, are really really keen now they can both swim well but they've just started in january doing triathlon and the older girl is seven no is 16 and she told me in two years time that she wants to do Pasagon man when she is 18 when she's allowed basically uh, which is just incredible uh, you i mean you know a race has made it when it has caught the imagination of the community so much that the, it spawned a triathlon club and then like cre created athletes, young children who want to then come and do this incredible race. It's, it's amazing. It's really, it was really amazing. Really inspiring to see the passion on the face of a 16 year old girl. <laughs> I'll see you in transition one. Yes. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Uh, to get on the bike. And... Oh. Okay. Are you cold? Yes. Well, no. I'm kind of like, yeah, nervous. Yeah. Okay. So you arrive at T1 around three o'clock on race morning. It's a very exposed location. It's on a port and the wind, prevailing wind direction, howls straight onto the port. So it's cold and you should definitely come prepared with 
as much winter kit as possible for that hour on race morning where you're standing around in transition and getting ready. Top tip, there is actually a cafe that's open on race morning at three o'clock, uh, which is next to transition, but barely anybody knew it was there. Hola. You get on the ferry around four o'clock, but the swim will not start until between five and half five. And actually this year, it didn't start until quarter to six. So from the time you get on the ferry, you can't take anything with you. The ferry doesn't come back to the port. So you are in your wetsuit plus your swim boy, and that's it. I think there was an element of certainly confusion and then relief when the announcement was made. Guys, I don't have good news for you. No tengo muy buenas noticias. The conditions are very rough. Las condiciones están muy malas. Obviously, people are disappointed. They can't swim the full distance. But the conditions were so bad. I think the majority of people were expecting it almost by that stage. Once everyone had sort of had it explained to them. I definitely explained to a few athletes what was happening. It's difficult to hear with all your swim kit on and your neoprene hat um, and on the back of a ferry. But once the word got out, everyone was pretty content with what was happening. But it still took another 45 minutes from that point before we were allowed to then jump in the water to swim. Once the last person jumps off the ferry, the horn goes as they are in the air. That is the start of the race. If you wait until you are that last person, you're going to swim an extra maybe 100 meters. Holding back and waiting isn't going to make that jump any easier. It's going to happen. You're going to do it. You've come all this way to race this race. You're not going to stay on the ferry. I was lucky enough to be able to come a week before and actually get to look at a lot of the bike route, do some practice swims. And I think the best thing about that was just being able to experience Patagonia in the week before the race, because you don't know what weather's gonna hit on race day. And being able to get out and see the country when it's a beautiful day is priceless. I had a local support crew, Ilse, who had volunteered to help me for the day. And I know there were a number of other athletes who had come here and then had local people support them. Ilse was absolutely brilliant, but I did have limited time with her before the race. And I'm sure that'll be true for a few people um, with their support crew. So I think it's really important that you have straight in your own head what your plan is for the race. Um, and the main thing that you should really think about is comfort. And especially for this race where the weather conditions can literally be anything. Um, and our, on race day this year, it was very cold and wet um, to start with. So having clothing options is really important. Come with literally prepared for all seasons. <laughs> um, make sure your crew knows what you have so that if you do need to stop and put clothes on or take them off, then they can facilitate that. Great job, Elsa. A uh, good mashed potato transition there. Yeah. Yeah. Hard work. We've only run 20 no, meters, it's haven't we? Okay. I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, she's doing great. Do this. Okay. The swim was shortened this year 
the frigate that we were going to swim around was out in the bay so we could see what that would have looked like if we'd done the full course essentially you swim from the jump on the ferry around a boat that's lit up uh, with all its lights on it's dark but it's very very easy to see and then when you turn towards the port they have um police cars with their sirens flashing on the port so you can see those from outer space and it's really really easy to just follow in a straight line towards those and then another unique thing about this race is when you get to the exit point there's just a concrete wall in front of you with a scramble net on it and i i wasn't expecting that i don't think anyone had really seen that before the race uh, maybe people who'd done the race before knew it was there but it was quite a surprise and a really fun moment for me to come up to the swim exit and just be faced with this scramble net that you have to climb up and then you get yanked out of the water by some guys on the shore. So having a shortened swim for my race meant all of the athletes who I was racing essentially came into transition one more or less at the same time within a couple of minutes of each other. So I was pretty frustrated in T1. I came in took my wetsuit off, sat down, started to get my clothes on. And it was just felt like it was taking forever. <laughs> and I had a plan of what to put on and I wasn't gonna deviate from that. But I was sitting on the floor thinking, God, all these people are like other girls I could see going up the bike, I could hear people shouting going past me. I was thinking, God, is this taking forever? <laughs> and especially my um, compression socks, which, are just so hard to get on not a wet body <laughs> but it's a false economy to rush through your transition as soon as i got on the bike almost from the first pedal stroke i was just over the moon because i knew i had my bike legs that day let's go caroline hop 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 Caroline's a minute off the lead girl. We've been going on about 10k. That's Saleta there, the Spanish girl just behind Caroline. So Caroline's caught her up and rode past her. It's still really early though. This is the first gravel section and there's a few of these en route, so you've got to be careful. I'm quite surprised how quickly the girls are riding through, I have to say. Uh, we're going to follow her now and just make sure that she's not going to punch her. I think within 10 or 15 kilometers, I was second lady. There was also Maggie, who had got out of transition about a minute ahead of me and was a minute up the road during that first flat section. And I was getting some splits from other crews that were standing on the okay. roadside. I'll take a split, next one, I'll take a split. And I wasn't making any time. It was a minute, a minute, a minute. First 40 Ks, always a minute. And I thought, God, I'm gonna really have to do some work here. But after 40k, you start a gradual climb and then it really steepens up about uh, 50k and you do the first of the big climbs of the day up towards Koike. And it was on that big climb where I started to see Maggie ahead of me and know that I was actually catching her really quickly at that point. It was a bit frustrating because the support crews were bunched up because we'd all come out of the swim a lot closer than we would if the race had you know, if the swim had been the full distance, the race is more spread out. So going up through that tunnel, there was a bit of traffic and I was having to shout at cars to to pull out so I could go down um, the sort of racing line on the inside. I think yeah. it's because the swim was short. Yeah. Everyone's together. Once I cleared the tunnel and cars were able to pull into laybys and things, traffic cleared and you hit the cobbles at the top of this climb. I knew I was near the top. I'd gone into the lead and I just felt great. So we just, we're about 70K. 
Caroline's just taking the lead, she's looking pretty comfortable. We've got a descent now with some uh, gravel, so we have to make sure that she negotiates that without punching afterwards. Here she is. It's essential to recce your line through that first piece of gravel before the race because there's quite a big step at the moment where the concrete stops and goes onto gravel. It was there four years ago, it's probably going to be there for a while, so it's definitely, if it's still here, worth getting out, making sure that you know where you're going to hit that um, gra gravel section. I rode um, 28mm tubeless setup with a Strada quite shallow front wheel and the Parkour Chrono rear wheel, so I would definitely not recommend a disc for this race. The wind is just insane. <laughs> tubeless setup means that you've got a low chance of getting a puncher. I rode 60 PSI. Definitely do not ride a high PSI for this race. You need to have that lower PSI for the gravel sections apart from anything. Done about 90 k's, I think, in total. Halfway on the bike, más o menos, aproxima. Mm, a little less. A little I less. Think. Okay. A little less. Okay. Yes. But no. now it gets really beautiful. Yes. Yes, it's really beautiful. But yeah. uh, you have to wait because when you go to Cerro Castillo on the Portezuelo, it's really beautiful. Yeah. 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 And uh, hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll see Caroline in a second. Yes, in a second. Yeah, she's. She come first. <laughs> when I wrecked the bike route, I remember saying to myself, this is my kind of bike route. Because apart from the first 40K where it's flat, you are having to work really hard all day. Um, although the prevailing wind is behind you, and that is a massive advantage. And at times I was definitely going faster on my bike than I've ever been before. And that's something to be prepared for because I know there were some people who were quite scared by the speeds that they got up to. But there's also a lot of steep sections, a lot of bigger climbs, and you are having to work hard all day on the bike. About maybe 120 k's in, Caroline's just come around the corner. This is the last gravel section. It's about 200 meters, so we're just waiting here, making sure she doesn't get a puncher just afterwards. But she's there in the front of the centre of the, um, of the road. We're just waiting now because we've got the secret nutrition, which is mashed potatoes that she's just going to squeeze out into a bag. So that's her first, her first um, portion of mashed potatoes now. And I use this in the Kelman and it worked really well for me. So and I think Caroline's going to try it out as well. So here she is coming now. So finishing off the gravel. So my nutrition strategy on race day was to have mashed potato in a zip bag, um, which I could just bite the corner off and squeeze out for the sort of middle section of the bike uh, when I could still have solids. And I had some just before hitting this really nasty section of the bike route. And it was amazing. I started to catch the guys in front of me. Um, and obviously when you're catching people, it makes you feel better. It boosts your confidence. You know you're riding well. Uh, my support was amazing. So I was getting everything I needed at the right times. So I had taken off a lair by then and I felt really comfortable. My bike setup was perfect. So I wasn't getting thrown around on the bike too much. And yeah, I was just in the flow. I just felt really, really good on the bike. Once you turn right and you start heading over the pass at a thousand meters and then down towards um, the finish, that's when the wind starts to bite and then it's a headwind. And because I'd been out and wrecked that last section of the course on a really, really windy day and it was freezing, <laughs> my support crew in the car had also reminded me at one point, don't forget about that final section because you need to be prepared mentally for that, but also with as much energy as you can for that last section, because you can lose so much time uh, fighting into that headwind. 
But then you top out and you go down the iconic section of road on this bike route, which is these amazing switchbacks going down into Cerro Castillo. section for the last 30k is so fast. One of the things that I always do on an X try is 40 kilometers from the end of the bike, I tell my crew to get to transition because there's a high possibility there's going to be traffic, a parking problem, I don't know, anything, but you need your crew to be in transition waiting for you. And this course, especially, it's so important that you give them enough time. So once I've got everything I needed, um, shout out to my crew, see you in T2, and they shot off. And then I knew, okay, I'm on my own, get this done, get to transition. And yeah, just make that last section of the bike count. I had not seen any of the run route before the race. I'd crewed here in 2018, so I'd, I'd seen the back end. I'd not run it, but I'd seen some of the back end of the run route. But the first 30 kilometers were just a surprise to me, as I'm sure it was for many athletes. And they were a surprise because they were absolutely incredibly stunning. The course is marked with posts and flags and you go over the top of this hill and then down and over a river. I just ran straight through it, didn't mess around. And I had spare socks in my running vest. So if I was starting to get really bad blisters later on, then I would change my socks. In actual fact, it was no problem. I, I did get blisters on the run. But I would have got blisters anyway, even without the river crossing, because the sand gets in your shoes and then you're running on gravel for the whole of the run and all the little stones, especially with a 60k an hour wind, are whipped up into your shoes anyway. So I think be prepared, maybe put your put Vaseline on your feet or tape your feet if you're normally somebody that's prone to blisters. Um, 
Oh, like me, just suck it up. <laughs> One of the symptoms that I get when I'm doing a long event like this is if I get low on salt, I start to feel dizzy and uh, my brain starts to feel foggy and mushed. <laughs> so I had put some mashed potato in my running vest and so I was craving this mashed potato. So I took my, I kept moving, but I took my running vest off and started to fish around in this running vest for this mashed potato. And of course I couldn't find it. And I was like, oh, I really thought I put it in there, but it wasn't there. Had to deal with that mentally and then just try to put it to the back of my mind and forget about it and hope that at 30 kilometers, my support crew will have brought some more mashed potato because I had loads of bags of it all prepped. Um, but obviously I had all my other nutrition with me, gels, um, you know, sweet stuff, bars, that kind of thing. Uh, but your palate on a race like that really gets bored of all the sweet, sugary things. And I always try to have something savoury with me. So I definitely took a bit of a dip, but mentally, when you take a dip in a race like this, you can always look up and just absorb the energy from the incredible surroundings. As well as there being a lot of steep uphills, there's also a lot of steep downhills. And every time I hit a downhill, I was just saying to myself, let go. Because if you break on those downhills, when you get towards the back end of the run, your quads are just blown. So I was really conscious that I had to n like try not to break too much and just really let myself flow down the hills. All I wanted that day was to get absolutely everything out of myself. And so I was running all of the hills and yes, my run was very slow, but I was keeping a, an eye on my heart rate and just saying, okay, if my heart rate gets really high, then I'll walk. But my heart rate was fine. My legs were fine. So I was just running all of the hills and I know the first 20, 25 kilometers, I, I really was moving well. On the run route, there are two checkpoints that are provided by the organization at 10K and at 20K. The second checkpoint um, at roughly 20K, I came up to the top of a hill and this lovely family was standing there and I said, are you a family as I came in? And it was two children, mum and dad, and, and they were wonderful. The dad filled my water up, had some Coke, uh, made it through as quickly as possible and then was on my way again. Family? Family. Where are you from? Scotland. Scotland. Hell. Yeah, baby, okay? Gracias. You full of it, yeah? Yeah. Full of running, let's go then. Good stuff. Vamos, vamos, Caroline. And I just remember nobody around, me on my own, howling wind, sweeping me off my feet nearly at times just having words with myself saying because my body was screaming at me at that point to stop and you're having to overcome mentally that all day and at, the, at this point in the run it's getting so loud in your head because the pain is there the suffering is there and you just want to stop and I had this conversation out loud with myself and I said it's not all about you you need to finish this race strong Those last five kilometers, I was just so deep in that 
well of suffering and running scared knowing that the, you know this was a competitive field of athletes and this is not a race you can just win I don't even know if I was moving that well at that point. I think I was just trying to run as best I could. I was just like, let's get it done. Yeah, I was, I was just enjoying enjoying that moment then. Caroline, are you okay? Yes! Fantastic! Really fantastic. Amazing. But I had to visit the well. And then the cavern. <laughs> yeah, dug deep. Yeah, yeah. My race is always against myself, and I always want to do my best. And that takes a lot of guts and determination, and sometimes emotion. This race is really special. It's special because of the athletes that come here. The crew are exceptional. They really want to make sure that all the athletes have a personal experience that is really well organized and clear and is on one of the most amazing triathlon routes in the world. Thank you.